Hi everyone, I'm Chris Frame and welcome back to my channel. The Queen Mary 2 is often heralded as the only ocean liner in active service. Entering service in 2004, the ship was the first true transatlantic express liner built since QE2 entered service in 1969. At 345 metres long and 149,500 gross tonnes, QM2 is the longest, tallest, widest, largest and most expensive ocean liner ever built. When referring to the ship as an ocean liner, I'm often asked the question, what's the difference between an ocean liner and a cruise ship? A fair question, given the confusion caused by the terms often being incorrectly interchanged when referring to the world's vast fleet of cruise ships. This question becomes even more difficult to answer when you consider that QM2 and the QE2 before her were dual-purpose liners, designed to perform the roles of both cruise ships and ocean liners. The vast majority of ships offering cruise voyages today are cruise ships, designed to undertake pleasure voyages largely in coastal waters. For example, a Miami to Miami voyage taking in the Bahamas, or even world cruises that take in many ports and where the cruise ship hugs the coast where possible. Ocean liners, on the other hand, are passenger ships that are designed to regularly undertake a line voyage, sailing between point A and point B across an expanse of open ocean. Perhaps the most iconic of these routes is the transatlantic crossing between North America and Europe, made famous by the great ocean liners of the Cunard Line, White Star Line, the United States Lines, Norddeutsche Lloyd and Hamburg America Line. This stretch of water led to the birth of the modern ocean liner, driven by innovations to help shipping companies link Europe and America. However, there have been hundreds of line voyage routes during the era of the ocean liner, linking countries across the globe. These include many of the famous routes, such as Union Castle's Britain to South Africa service, P&O's voyages linking Europe to India, China and Australia, as well as inter-Asia voyages and regular trans-Pacific crossings, to name just a few of the line voyages that existed. The first purpose-built ocean liner was the SS Great Western of 1838. Designed by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the ship was to be the first vessel able to cross the Atlantic using steam power for the majority of the journey. There had been steamship crossings in the Atlantic prior to Great Western, however these ships only utilised their steam engine for short bursts and relied on auxiliary sails and wind power for the majority of their journey. But Brunel's design was novel, large and efficient enough to provide improved buoyancy compared to earlier steamship designs. This coupled with improvements in engine technology enabled the Great Western to undertake the majority of her voyages under power, setting her apart from the earlier steamships. Unfortunately, the Great Western's triumphant entry into service was challenged when a rival firm chartered the 700-ton steamer Sirius and completed a transatlantic crossing ahead of a Great Western's maiden voyage. Yet the Great Western, which departed four days after Sirius, came to within a day of overtaking its rival, helping to prove that Brunel's purpose-built ocean liner was the more advanced of the two vessels. So what makes an ocean liner? Ocean liners are designed to undertake long duration deep ocean voyages to a strict timetable. As with modern air travel, in the era of the ocean liner, passengers expected to depart and arrive on time, while government mail and freight contracts held shipping lines accountable to strict timetables. This meant that ocean liners had to be capable of sailing through all weather conditions, from flat calm to force 12. Lost time due to bad weather had to be made up, meaning powerful engines were employed. While the early ocean liners were paddle steamers, by the 1880s, screw propellers had become the norm. By the 1900s, turbines started to eclipse reciprocating engines in powering ocean liners, while modern ships like QM2 are powered by diesel engines and gas turbines. So with that in mind, what are some of the ocean liner characteristics that can help you identify an ocean liner from a cruise ship? The bow on ocean liners, the area from the forward tip of the hull to the superstructure, is noticeably larger than that on a cruise ship. Ocean liner bows are designed to ensure that the superstructure is protected from the waves experienced in open ocean, while some designs, such as the French Lines Normandy and Cunard's Queen Mary II, take this a step further and also employ a breakwater to help deflect waves away from the superstructure and protect the ship. Ocean liners are very strong, with steel noticeably thicker than that used on board cruise ships. This is to ensure the ship is strong enough to withstand the heavy seas that it will experience in open ocean year after year. A good example is the Queen Mary II, 
which has steel plates between 28 and 30 mm thick, far greater than the 20 to 23 mm thickness found on a typical cruise ship. Nearly all ocean liners from the 1800s onwards had their navigational bridge on or close to the topmost deck. This is to ensure not only a good view of the long bow, but also to protect the navigation equipment and bridge officers from the weather. We can see this design trait on modern liners such as QE2 and Queen Mary 2. In contrast, cruise ships often have several decks of passenger accommodation or forward-facing lounges atop their bridge, which can be an easy way to differentiate the two designs. Ocean liners are subject to heavy seas, particularly during rough winter crossings. As such, the boat deck is usually near the top of the vessel's superstructure to protect the boats from high seas. While this is a common trait amongst designs, there have been some noticeable exceptions. Queen Mary II, for example, appears to have her boat deck amidships. However, it is important to note that the sheer size of the ship means that her boat deck is approximately as high above the waterline as QE2s, meaning her boats are safe. Some ocean liners, such as Oriana and Canberra, had their boats lower in the hull. While these ships were not designed for the regular crossings of the characteristically rough Atlantic, they were expected to operate line voyages to Australia regardless of the weather. Their boat decks included slanted supports with the boats held on davits within the hull to ensure their safety during voyages. You'll also notice that many cruise ships have their lifeboats located within the hull. This is to allow for large, unobstructed balcony cabins to be built in the superstructure, with balcony cabins becoming a very important aspect of the cruise experience. Ocean liners are designed to undertake a scheduled, timely voyage. As such, ocean liners require more speed than cruise ships, which are usually designed to meander at a more leisurely pace from port to port. Since the 1970s, many liners were converted to undertake cruising, yet they remained faster than their modern counterparts. The fastest ocean liner of all time was the SS United States, which entered service in 1952. She still holds a record for the fastest westbound transatlantic crossing, with an average speed of 34.51 knots achieved during that crossing. Today, Queen Mary II is the fastest passenger ship in service. QE2 was even faster, able to achieve 32.5 knots and regularly sailed at 30 knots during cruises, which allowed the ship to take in more ports and still maintain her cruising schedule. Speed isn't as important for cruise ships. In fact, Cunard's current Queen Victoria and Queen Elizabeth both have top speeds of 23.7 knots, which is comparable to the Lucania and Campania Cunard liners built in 1882. It is also important to note that there are a few ocean liners still in service. These are ships that meet all of the above criteria and were designed for line voyages, though today they perform cruising roles. These include the Marco Polo and the Astoria, both of which are popular with shipping enthusiasts. Since the advent of the jet, the need for full-time ocean liners has diminished. As a result, some lines created dual-purpose liners. Dual-purpose liners are those that were designed to undertake both functions. This includes Rotterdam, Oceanic, QE2 and Queen Mary 2. These ships in every respect are ocean liners, but they've also had cruising elements included into their design. This means they can operate line voyages when the demand is high and yet easily pivot to cruising to allow them to remain profitable year-round. I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please give it a thumbs up or leave a comment. If you like this kind of content, please subscribe and don't forget to hit the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. If you're interested in more ocean liner content, check out my photographic tour of the QE2, the most used and longest serving express liner of all time. Or if you are more interested in cruising news, check out my cruise news playlist. Thanks again for watching, and until the next time we are able to cruise, I hope to see you on board.